You can be, you can be seated. <clears throat> well, as Ron said earlier, we're in coming to a final message in this series we've called Next, asking what's next for our church. And so we've talked about what's next for our corporate worship and what's next for our discipleship, what's next for our witness, even what's next for our giving to the Lord. And today we ask, what is next for our mission? And let me define what I mean by mission, at least for our purposes here this morning. I mean that in the broadest possible terms. So notice, it's not missions, plural, which we usually mean to be global missions. Global missions is certainly included in what I have in mind under that word mission. And global missions is certainly massively important for us as a church, but Think broader than global missions. Maybe think in terms of a mission statement that a, a business may have. Or what we have as a church, a mission statement. I can't remember if it's a mission statement or a vision statement. It's one of those. It's what we say we're about. It's on the front of your bulletin every week. We're spreading God's glory broader and deeper. We believe we need God's glory. We believe that's his plan, his intention for his glory to spread. We want it to spread to more people in Albuquerque. We want it to spread beyond our city to the nations. And we want those who have experienced that saving glory to grow in a deeper understanding and even experience of that glory. We're spreading God's glory broader and deeper. And that phrase summarizes much of what we've been talking about in the last five weeks with worship and discipleship, witness and giving. That mission also gives us the vision and aim and goal for any renovation or expansion plans we've talked about in recent days. But think even broader than that still. Don't think just in terms of church life but our whole lives, not just when we meet together, but when we scatter throughout the week. Don't just think now or in this season of life, but in this age in which we live, between Christ's first coming and his second coming. Think that big a picture so we can ask it like this. What should be our approach our mindset, our orientation, our outlook as servants of Christ living between his first coming and his second coming. That's what I'm after this morning. That's what I mean by what's our mission. So turn with me to Matthew 25 in your Bibles. Matthew 25, the first book of the New Testament, Matthew. And in chapter 25, we find Jesus is teaching of the parable of the talents. You might wonder, why this passage? Why, why now? Why go there? Well, partly it's just because the Lord has been bringing this passage back to me again and again. has been driving it deeper in my thought and in my heart. And um, it was just a matter of time before I felt the need to get it to you and pass it along. And I think this will suit our purposes for today. Matthew 25, starting in verse 14, Jesus says, For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But the one who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. 
And he also, who had the two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I've not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will be more given And he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, as I said, this is a parable. Jesus taught in parables. Fictitious stories meant to illustrate truth. This parable is about the kingdom of heaven. It begins with that word, it, for it will be like. Well, and then we look ahead and we find out that back in verse 1, there was a separate parable there that began. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like. So that's what it means in verse 14. The kingdom of heaven is the reign of Christ now in view of the consummation of his reign at the end of the age. In fact, there are three parables stacked next to each other. Back in chapter 14, verse 45, we have the parable of the wise servant. In chapter 25, it's the parable of the ten virgins that begins that chapter, and then the parable of the talents. They all anticipate Christ's coming Again, that's what Jesus taught in chapter 24, and then that's what he illustrates and applies in these three parables, explaining that his servants must keep watch and keep waiting for his return. They must not lose heart. They must stay ready, even if it seems that he's delayed beyond what is reasonable. And with our parable, there's this added feature. While we wait, we should be busy for him, productive for him. Our parable has a master and three servants. Each servant is put in charge of a portion of the master's resources. They're put in charge of the master's resources before he goes away. And then, while he's away, each one has a response to those resources that he has assigned to them. And then when he returns, each of these servants receives a kind of reward, whether good or bad, for how they've handled the resources. So we've got resources, responses, rewards. There's our outline. So first, varied resources. Resources are in verses 14 to 15. They're called talents. But not talents like America's got talent. Not talents like your daughter, I'm sure, is very talented at ballet and piano. And your son's very talented with that weird hand noise thing he does or something like that. A a talent back then in Bible times was at first a measurement of weight and then later a measurement of riches in gold or silver or copper. So estimates vary among the scholars as to what a talent back then would equate to in U.S. dollars today. But we know for sure that it was the largest denomination of wealth. So I don't know if they still make the $1,000 bill for the U.S. anymore. But if so, that would be our largest denomination of currency. 
And yet for them back then, the talent was certainly much, much bigger than $1,000. The ESV Study Bible estimates it would be worth $600,000 in today's U.S. dollars. So five talents would be three million. Two talents would be 1.2 million. And the one talent is still 600,000. No small potatoes. Implied right at the beginning and then made clear later on in the parable is that these servants are not given a going away gift by their master, but have been entrusted, verse 14, with his possessions. They've been given these large sums with the expectation that they would put those sums to work. In this culture, servants were not so much those who worked the fields or cleaned the house or made the food. Oftentimes, servants would be managers of the home, managers of the household, managers of the affairs of the master, and doing his bidding while he was away. This would be understood, even though it's not stated explicitly at the beginning of the parable. Servants were to do, when the master was away, what the master would do if he wasn't away. And in this case, the master would take his wealth, he'd put it to work, and hopefully make more. Now, this is not necessarily teaching us a business principle. It's not necessarily proving to us the biblical legitimacy of investments, Though I think that's assumed in the parable. Jesus assumes this is how businesses work. This is how wealthy men do business. But the talents represent something. They represent some things, more than just money. I think we could summarize what talents represent with just two words, opportunities and resources. Opportunities for the Lord and resources given from the Lord. That's, that's really what the parable is about, how we use opportunities and resources from the Lord for the Lord. Jesus in the parable is the master. The servants are clearly his servants, Christians. And the parable teaches that he gives us various opportunities and resources for him, from him. To his purposes. J.C. Ryle comments like this, and so well anything whereby we may glorify God is a talent. Our gifts, our influence, our money, our knowledge, our health, our strength, our time, our senses, our reason, our intellect, our memory, our affections, our privileges as members of Christ's church, our advantages as possessors of the Bible, all our talents. Whence came these things, he asks? What hand bestowed them? Why are we what we are? There's only one answer to these questions. All that we have is a loan from God. We are God's stewards. Ah, There's that word again, stewards. We've been talking about that in recent weeks. Stewards and stewardship, meaning that everything we have is God's and it's an assignment. We're not owners, we're managers. It's not that he gives everything that we have and we're supposed to give a small portion of it back to him. It's that we're in charge of all that's his. And some of it does need to go to put clothes on the kids and food on the table and to pay the mortgage. And some of it does need to go to supporting a local church and sending missionaries abroad. But it's all for God, it's all God's. This means that every Christian is not only saved or forgiven and redeemed, but they're saved to serve. Our identity in other parts of the Bible is described as being like children in relation to God, our Father. But here the word picture is that we are servants and he is the master. And the master does not give his servants uniformly their resources. Notice that. Jesus does not uniformly give gifts and resources to his servants. He gave one five talents, another two, and another just one. He gave, it says, according to their ability. 
It's just like it is with spiritual gifts, which we read about in Romans 12 or 1 Corinthians 12. We're not all supposed to have the same gift. We're not all the same people. Even if we would want to be this or that, if we were all the same, even to the nth degree, it would be boring. He's made life, he's made the church sort of synergistic. To think of the analogy of the body that we find in the Bible for the church. Many parts, one body, one purpose, serving different functions. Hand, eye, some are more prominent than others, more visible than others, but none are unnecessary. So whatever we have is what God gave us. Whatever we are is what God made us. Whatever he has put before us to do, he has put before us to do for him and for his grand purposes. You might aspire to do something more, something different, something better down the line. There's nothing wrong with that. You may find yourself doing something different down the line than you're doing right now. You might find that later on in life, God adds to your plate, so to speak. Or perhaps later on in life, he takes some things off your plate. But wherever you find yourself, even right now, a student, a stay-at-home mom, a secretary, an engineer, a politician, a church member, a neighbor. You see, these categories overlap. We're often several things at once. But what are you? And what are your assignments, your opportunities, your resources? Whatever you have, whatever you are, whatever is before you right now, these are assignments from God. And so we must be careful to not envy those who seem to do more for God, to seem to have more that's useful for God. I have some friends that write a book or two a year. And I just think, you got a different brain than I have. You have a different capacity than I have. And I have to fight envy, wishing I could do that, but... But, but hopefully the Lord leads me a little further down a path and I'm thankful that he uses them like that and, well, he'll use me as he uses me. You must be careful to not envy those who have a different assignment or seem to have been given more. He's the master. But we must also be careful to not shrink back from what he has given us, from what we can do, from what he has put before us. They're varied resources. Secondly, there are varied responses. Verses 16 to 18 record the responses of these three servants. Before we get to that, notice at the end of verse 15, now with the resources distributed, with the expectations assumed to be clear, the master, it says, went away, clearly hinting at the coming cross, death, burial, resurrection and ascension of Jesus he went away that's what's coming you could turn to Matthew 26 and read that's what's actually happening in the narrative right after this that's what Jesus was preparing his disciples for with this teaching in Matthew 24 and 25 he's going to go away and how will they respond well there are only two kinds of responses here though there are three servants The first two servants immediately invest their master's resources. It says, verse 16, at once they did this. And though it was immediate, apparently it was ongoing. You see, they traded, verse 16. And in the Greek, the the tense is such that this is clearly ongoing. They didn't do a one and done kind of investment and get double the reward, but This was ongoing trading while the master was away. Immediate, ongoing, industrial, industrious rather, trading for the master. And the result was double. Five talents, produced five talents more. The guy with two talents got two talents more. 
They didn't start with the same. They didn't need to end with the same. But both were faithful with what they'd been given. But not the third servant. Verse 18. He who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, you have to first understand that in these days, before safes in your home, like some of you might have, before safety deposit boxes down at the bank, hiding money in the ground back then in Bible times wasn't that weird of a thing. Some of you may have some gold coins in your backyard or a stack of hundreds somewhere buried in your backyard. Now, let's be honest. These days, I was going to say that's cool, but it's not cool. It's kind of weird, isn't it? It's sort of quirky if you bury things in your backyard these days. Some of you do it. That's fine. Good on you. But in these days, in Bible times, it was pretty common, and it was a legitimate way to protect what you had. So what's wrong with what this man did? Well, we've already seen something of it. We'll see more in just a bit. But knowing that servant-master relationship back then, knowing that servants weren't merely slaves, but also managers, knowing that it wasn't supposed to just be protected, but it was supposed to be productive. It'd be like a man today who maybe he owns a small um, a hardware, let's say, and he hires a manager uh, someone who will you know, take care of the store when he's away, especially when he goes away on vacation. And imagine that the manager that he hires, when the, manager, when the owner goes away, he, he just leaves the closed sign on the door and keeps the doors locked. No one robs from the safe. No one holds up the clerk and steals from the teller. No kids come in and steal the random crescent wrench to fix their go-kart. Everything stays safe. Everything is still the same as when the owner left. But, but that's not how stores work. It's supposed to be open for business. You're not supposed to stay the same. You're supposed to make money. You're supposed to, you're supposed to generate some revenue, and that would have been expected of the manager of the hardware store, and it certainly was expected of this third servant even though he was only given one talent, which was no small amount. Varied resources, varied responses. Then thirdly, there are varied rewards. There are three servants, two kinds of responses, and then there are really two kinds of rewards. And if you're taking notes, you might want to put rewards in quotes here because, as I said before, there's a, a negative and a positive Think of reward as mostly positive, but there's clearly a negative response to what they did when the master returns. And by the way, notice verse 19, the master was away, it says, a long time, and then the master of the servants came. That's the second coming, when he came. Remember, that's what Jesus is laying out here, what to do in between his first and second coming. How do we wait? How do we watch? What should we do? We should work in view of the master's coming, even if it may take longer than we expect. Indeed, it has taken longer than most Christians would expect. It's been almost 2,000 years since Christ's first coming. It may be 2,000 more or two weeks more before his second coming. No man knows the hour. It may be long, it may be short, but it is sure. He is coming. And when he comes, what will he find? How will he find us? Will we have been busy? Well, the first servant reports the doubling of his five talents. Not to boast, just to report. He now has five more. He was entrusted with something close to three million. Now has six. The second servant reports the same, the doubling of his talents. He had two, now he has two more. He turned 1.2 million into 2.4 million for his master. And the master says the same thing to each of these faithful servants. Word for word, verse 21 and 23, he said, Well done, 
good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Three sentences there in each of those verses. And each one really deserves careful attention. I I encourage you to meditate upon them on your own later on. But just think, well done, good and faithful servant. What commendation, what reward of of further resources. You've been faithful over a little, three million dollars. Now you'll be faithful over a lot. Whoa, what's that mean? How much is that? Well, it's talking about a new heaven and a new earth, an inheritance that we can't imagine. Enter into the joy of your master then. On the level of the parable, what that means is that the servant is no longer just a servant. Because he's good and faithful and he's done well, and because he's enlarged, he's gotten an enlarged responsibility, he is now sort of an equal with the master. The master's joy is part of his experience. Enter into the joy of your master. Let's celebrate. Let's feast tonight. But on the level of us, the reader of the passage, enter into the joy of your master. That should ring heaven's bells in our ears. That's what that's about. That's what heaven is. The joy of your master. Which means heaven will be happy And heaven will be productive. Far from heaven being a bunch of of us sitting on clouds and listening to music of harps. We'll be productive. We'll be given more there than we had here with that which we were faithful. We will enter into the joy of our master. But not this third servant. The third servant, verse 24, he said, Master, I knew you to be a Hard man, difficult, short-tempered, a taskmaster, unreasonable, a hard man, like Pharaoh was a hard, hard Pharaoh. I knew you to be the kind of master who reaps where you didn't sow. And that's saying more than just you make us do the work and you get all the rewards. No, he's saying... You're not trustworthy. You're not ethical. You're a man who just is out for gain. And you don't care who did the sowing. And because of that, he says, I was afraid. And so I hid your talent in the ground. I played it safe rather than risk the investment and possibly lose it. You're a hard man. Here. Have what's yours. Doug O'Donnell, in his commentary on Matthew, he, he puts it so well. He says, this man, this third servant, sees Jesus as a hard or harsh or even mean, merciless or cruel character who acts unjustly, demanding a harvest from a field where no seeds have been planted. His view of God, if you'll allow me, is so high, it's too low. It's as if the man said, Oh Lord, you're such a sovereign master, an unmoved mover, that whatever I did with this talent wouldn't matter to you anyway, so I did nothing. He's cloaked his laziness behind his solemn God talk excuses. He has a high view of God, but a wrong view of God. He has a fear of God, but an improper fear of God. And thus he has the audacity to blame generous Jesus for his own apathy and inactivity. Whew, that stings, but it's right. And what the master says in response stings even more, and it's even more true. You wicked and slothful servant, Oh, so you knew that I reap where I've not sown and gather where I scattered no seed? Yes, I said that sarcastically on purpose. I think that's the intent. In other words, if you thought I was such 
a hard man, so exacting and cruel, the least you could have done was put the money in the bank where they give you, you know, 0.7% annually and it stays safe. And at least I'd have a little bit more than what I gave you when I left. Jesus continues, verse 28, so take the talent from him and give it to him who had 10. And then verse 30, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So here's his reward. Removal from the resources he had been given. Removal from the presence of his good master for good. And thrown in to nothing less than hell itself. It's hell. It's like the language of entering the joy of your master describes heaven. So the language of being thrown into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the language of hell. I know many of you are thinking at this point, hell? Hell for not sufficiently putting to use the master's resources? That seems a bit much. But we have to think of both his attitude towards God and his actions towards God. Not just the actions. Behind the actions is an attitude toward God or an approach to God in a wrong approach to God. The servant thought that the master was cruel and harsh and unreasonable and even unethical. He was afraid of his master, but not with godly fear, which is part of worship. No, he he cowered before his master, expecting to get wrath. And so he tried to protect his own. He had God fundamentally wrong. He had Jesus fundamentally backwards. And so his estimation of Jesus betrays that he doesn't understand Jesus. He doesn't believe in Jesus. He doesn't have salvation even though he's called a servant. He didn't understand the graciousness of this whole scenario It's not that he had salvation taken from him because he didn't do enough. It's that he never understood the grace of God that transforms a worthless man into somewhat fruitful of a man. And you need to hear this if you're not a Christian because it's of utmost importance that you don't get this wrong and you don't mishear this. We Christians do not believe that we're ever right with God because we've been faithful enough before God or even fruitful for Jesus. We can't earn his favor. We can't earn a right to enter into heaven. As Jesus put it back in Matthew 20, he calls himself the son of man. He said he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life. That is upon the cross as a payment or a ransom for sin, for the sins of many. That's salvation. That's the gospel. That's how someone becomes a Christian. They're coming to believe that they couldn't serve their way to Jesus. He had to come to them as a servant, more than that, as a sacrifice, a payment for sin. If you believe that and ask for it from God, you will receive it. We pray you would today. We earnestly pray that you would today. But know this, that once he saves you, he's not done with you. He doesn't just forgive you, but he employs you. He saves and he makes us happy servants. We're not saved by our good works, but he saves us unto good works, Ephesians 2.10 says. And so those first two servants didn't earn heaven because of their faithfulness, but having proved their faithfulness, which came to them on account of God's transforming grace, the gospel remains intact, and yet, well, good works are part of the equation somehow. And so if you're a saved servant of Christ here today, 
that know this, realize this afresh, that he has entrusted to you various gifts and resources and opportunities and assignments. And each one is from him and each one is for him. And each one deserves your conscious effort for his glory, for his work, and for his purposes. So are you putting them to his purposes? Whatever it is he's given you to do, whatever it is is before you, whatever you could do for him, whatever he has made you to be. Are you holding back? Are you hiding some things to keep from him? What might you be wrongly holding on to or even just holding on to too tightly rather than use it for his purposes? And does that come from a wrong view of God? That he's too cold, too tough, too exacting, a taskmaster. So you better keep all the pleasures for yourself that you can because there aren't enough pleasures in him. Does perhaps holding back come from a forgetfulness about his return one day? Or a forgetfulness about the amazing rewards that come with his return someday. Is his commendation not enough for us? Is his eternal joy and presence with him not enough, enough for us? Now, while the parable of the talents certainly uses financial and monetary, well, a word picture, we could say, to teach us something that's far beyond just money. Keep that in mind, right? Everything J.C. Ryle said about talents, gifts, influence, money, knowledge, health, strength, time. Yes, but let's not think that treasures aren't part of the equation. Let's not get to treasures just yet, though. Think of the gospel. You've been given the gospel have you just put it under a rock? You know the gospel. You have the gospel. This is a resource the Lord has given you to use for his glory. You may not be able to use it that well. Well, welcome to the one talent crowd. I find myself among those. But let's be busy. Let's be productive. Let's use whatever amount of gospel talent he's given us. We have a Bible in our fingertips, basically, whether it's in our phones or in print on our laps. Do we use it? Does it sit idly by, except for two hours a week when we bring it here? Are we putting it to use in our own lives, putting it to use in the lives of others? You've been given a home and a kitchen table. Is that where you just huddle up and close the doors and Shut things in and, and keep everyone else out? Or, or is this a resource for hospitality and fellowship and love? On and on the lists could go of different applications. And yes, we have been given certain financial resources. That is one category of talents, even though talents is of that category in the parable. The parable of the talent certainly means more than just kingdom giving, but it doesn't mean less than kingdom giving. So are you employing your possessions and your finances for Christ's greater good? Some of you are really good at making money. Praise God for that. Praise God for it. It's in the parable. It's what you're supposed to do. You have some money, turn it into more money. That's good business. Now what? What are you going to do with that? What's that for? How will you employ that for Christ's greater purposes? Some of you don't have much at all. And you say, well, I don't have much. I wish I did. I would give more if I had more. And we say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Give whatever God has provided for you to give. And do it with joy, do it for his purposes, do it worshipfully, do it in view of his coming promises. 
with this kind of gospel that we believe that the Son of Man came to serve us and die for us, and with this kind of undeserved gifting that he has for each of us, which maybe we want more, maybe we want different gifts, but, but he's sovereign, he's wise. With the kind of stewardship he's assigned to us, with the kind of return that is so sure, and with the kind of rewards that come when he returns, we can't be the kind of people who bury his resources, who hold them back or blame him for what we don't have. While the master is away, he calls us to be watchful, faithful, fruitful. And that is one reason why we should strategically and sacrificially and routinely and worshipfully give to his kingdom work, both in a local church and beyond. And we should do it freely. Freely. Remember Exodus 35? Whoever is of a generous heart, bring it in. And those whose hearts were stirred and those whose spirits were moved, they brought the Lord's contribution. And in the end, Moses had to say, whoa, 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 whoa. The tradesmen have more than enough. The the skilled workers have more than enough. They're drowning in your possessions, in your gifts, in your contributions. And so today, if you consider Desert Springs Church your church home, as Ron said earlier, we invite you today to commit and to freely commit what, as you have determined as an individual or as a family, what is sacrificial, generous, happy, worshipful giving to the local church. We're asking you to commit to that for the next two years. We're asking you to write that down on a commitment card that you got in your bulletin on the way in if you haven't seen it before. We're asking you to let us know your commitment over the next couple of years simply so we can plan accordingly. We think a few facility renovation and expansion projects around here would serve us well for ministry, for Kingdom productivity for our master for decades to come, perhaps for a century to come. Well, a few weeks ago, about 150 of us were gathered in this room for what we called Advance Commitment Night, where we we filled out those commitment cards and we dropped them in offering boxes and we had a bit of a celebration about it and it was a sweet time. Uh, We're going to watch a video now that records some of that and shares some testimonies of those who were there. Let's watch. Tonight meant to me just a rediscovery of understanding God's worth and value and how he spared nothing in saving us and calling us to himself by sending his own son so excited to give out of what God has given to us. How can we not? Um, God has blessed us, and it's just exciting to be able to give back just a portion of what he has given to us. It was just such a wonderful evening to watch the excitement on everyone's faces as we brought our gifts before the Lord and asked that he would use them to his glory, and it's been a real pleasure to just share in that with everyone tonight. I'm thankful to be able to take part in what the Lord is doing here at Desert Springs. And I'm more thankful that we have a group of elders that we can trust that are grounded in God's word and are passionate about the gospel and the great commission to bring God's glory to the ends of the earth and to be able to take part in what God is doing, not just Desert Springs. Um, It's bigger than just Desert Springs. It's bigger than just what is happening here um, because it's a part of the Great Commission. When they got up there, Ron and Ryan, and explained what this was, this next, I was so excited. My heart was so full of joy and I am so 100,000% 
ready to be involved in this with my whole heart. It's not about uh, getting certain amounts of money or doing a certain percentage of money, but it's about the heart and about giving out of the heart. And, and that's been very special for me. It's no longer like an obligation, but more of just a sacrifice of praise and love for the Lord for all He's done for me. You know, oftentimes uh, giving is separated from the gospel and separated from grace and what God has done for us uh, through Christ. And uh, it, just the privilege it is to give as part of who we are in Christ. That's been the emphasis and been helpful for me. Everything that we have has been given to us first. And so we don't give anything that the Lord hasn't provided. And we're grateful to be part of a body of generous givers and we feel blessed to be here at DSC. We came to realize we needed to think more and pray more about our giving and think about it being an act of worship. I've been struggling with one church and we heard two people that talked about one church and what it meant to them and a light just started kind of turning on and I started seeing the possibilities of one church. Just seeing what everybody you know had to say tonight what was what God was doing in their hearts just helped me to get a little more clarification in mind about the sacrificial giving and what that might look like for us. So I'm excited about what God's going to do. And I know it's going to be marvelous. <laughs> <laughs>